As promised, we're moving on now to another brick, to Russia. Um, as everybody knows, Russia emerged very strongly from the last big global financial crisis of 97-98. Now, a decade later, Russia faces a new crisis. We have a very distinguished speaker from Moscow to share with us his thoughts on how Russia is coping with its challenges. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Igor Jorgens. He's an economist by training. He's the vice president of the Russian Union of Industrialists and Entrepreneurs, which is basically the highest chamber of commerce in Russia, an extremely influential body. He's also the chairman of the board of Renaissance Capital. He's a professor at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow, and he's most recently a co-founder of the Institute of Contemporary Development in Moscow, of which President Medvedev is the chairman of the Board of Trustees. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mr. Jurgens. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It's a great honor and the great privilege to speak at St. Gallen. Uh, but my, my lesson from, from my communication with the authorities of St. Gallen University is that you have to be very tough. They asked me to send the speech. I send them the speech. They said, it's probably not a stupid speech, but we need a different speech and three times shorter. <laughs> so, so now I'm uh, under a lot of pressure, so much so that uh, His Excellency, Mr. President of Estonia, Mr. Ilvis, is already in, in place, and he's one who understands uh, the post-Soviet uh, economic and political space probably even better than I do. So... Uh, having said, said of all of this, I will concentrate not on the part which is Russia and economic crisis. I'm, I'm, I will be more than willing to, to, to try to answer your questions on that. But uh, I will be dealing with the issue which was uh, announced, which is business and politics, business and government. Uh, business and government in Russia since the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, lived uh, during different stages. It was first a honeymoon with Mr. Yeltsin. Then it was a separation with Mr. Uh, Putin. Uh, then hopefully we'll have a conciliation, reconciliation of two parties, but on whose terms? Uh, it, it's, it's a good question mark. So let me start with the honeymoon. Uh, 91, all laws uh, told you to enrich yourselves, no matter what. Uh, at any price, uh, forget about social network, uh, forget about social insurance, forget about all social obligations. You have to become rich and you have to become economically efficient. The signal was well taken and enrichment started. And, and it started at such a pace that by 95, during the second a democratic election, or first election, for that matter, of Mr. Yeltsin, his popularity went down to 3%, and the popularity of his rival, the leader of the Communist Party of Russia, Mr. Zyuganov, went up to 50%. So, 95, six months before election, uh, ailing Yeltsin is 3%, and the Communist at 50%. Uh, business got together and started thinking of what, what, what's in it. N normally, business is very apolitical, as you know. During all the wars, we know that uh, all businessmen were ready to cooperate with no matter whom, uh, just uh, to know the rules of the game. Uh, very interesting story of, of that time. Seven bankers, uh, two of them still bankers and still alive. Uh, five of them uh, are not with us anymore. Three in exile, one physically dead, but for natural causes. <laughs> Uh, uh, so those seven bankers, not very far from here in the little town of Davos, got together during the World Economic Forum, and Mr. Schwab invited Mr. Zyuganov, the communist leader, because Mr. Schwab, as well as many others, thought that here is the new president of uh, Russian Federation, because there was no way how you can raise Yeltsin's popularity rate from 3%. So those seven bankers get with Mr. Zyuganov uh, uh, in, in one of the hotels of, of Davos World Economic Forum, uh, and there was almost a deal, 
and I talked to both sides afterwards, the only thing which they didn't agree with is when bluntly asked, can you, Mr. Zyuganov, disassociate yourself from the General Mukashov, one of his closest aides, which was very well known for his anti-Semitic remarks. And, uh, and um, Zyuganov didn't say no, but he didn't say yes either. And that was sort of the last straw. And in February 1995, against all tides, those seven bankers started their campaign to try to democratically elect Mr. Yeltsin. Uh, I will not tell you the whole saga because it, it's too difficult, it's not democratic, it's dirty, but they won. They won, uh, but they didn't want for nothing. Uh, loan for shares is a world-known scheme which was uh, employed ex right after the election. So Mr. Yeltsin offered them for the direct financial assistance, those seven bankers and others who were around them, uh, uh, the assets uh, at half price, to put it mildly, one-tenth of the price would be probably uh, a good estimate of what they received of the national wealth. From this starts the very sad saga of Russian business, who still, in that category of big business, is not considered legitimate by Russian people at large. They think that they've been robbed of their assets uh, without proper compensation. And probably they're not very far from truth, but the truth is always a very complicated issue. Uh, when Mr. Yeltsin picked up his uh, 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 candidate, his, uh, his uh, successor, Mr. Putin, he came to power with a different idea. He understood that social unrest is in the making. Chechen war is the war. Uh, the mutiny or creeping mutiny in the Caucasus and in the Islamic republics of Russia was a fait accompli. So he had to consolidate regime and he invited those people, I mean those business people who really run uh, uh, Russia in, in shadow, from the shadows, uh, and he offered them the deal. He said, <clears throat> I will protect your class interests because I do believe in uh, market economy and in the future of Russia uh, with the rest of the world. And, and not, not, uh, the, the, I, I'm, not, I'm against the, the, the comeback to the totalitarian or central plan economy or whatever. But uh, I can only do that if you, start, if you stop interfering into the political affairs. You are so unpopular, you are so ugly <laughs> that I, cannot, I simply cannot deal with that if you are going to be uh, very closely associated with the Kremlin. Uh, the, uh, this hint, or this very direct message, was taken seriously by most, but uh, by two immediately. Mr. Berezovsky said no, because uh, he offered Putin to Yeltsin as a candidate, by the way, and he thought that he can be a, a playmaster for, for quite some time. So he received the first notice. He was deprived of the first channel of Russian television, of some other assets which were acquired in, in a murky manner, and he was exiled to London. Mr. Gusinski didn't understand altogether the message. He was in control of the second largest channel, NTV, which was a very good uh, television channel, very interesting one, and with lots of excellent journalism. Uh, he didn't understand uh, the message. He was deprived of his uh, second, uh, uh, this second channel, and his bank was, uh, after 1998 crisis, in a bad shape anyhow, and he was exiled to Israel and then, I think, to Spain, and he's around that, those countries now. Uh, after that, a truce came, armistice. And between 2000 and 2003, the relationship between business, big business, and Kremlin was excellent. I was part of it because the Russian Union of Industrialists was chosen as the place to negotiate tax reform, banking reform, pension reform, judiciary reform. We worked day and night. Uh, we, having analytical minds better than the state had at that time, uh, we proposed all kind of scenarios. They were taken seriously. We had regular sessions with Mr. Putin as the president and his staff. 
lots of things were used, and we had a more or less uh, equal uh, dialogue. 2003 came, and the third man out of those seven I mentioned to you, Mr. Khodorkovsky, thought that, no, this is not my game. Apart from being the uh, CEO and the owner of the largest and best, at that time, most effective uh, oil company, first of all, he decided, uh, without any consent of the Kremlin or authorities, to probably strike a deal with ExxonMobil uh, selling a control package. Second of all, he thought that probably we should be not a presidential but parliamentary republic, and he started uh, recruiting people right in the parliament. And third, uh, he started saying some very harsh truths the way he see it, or some, some, some things which, put it mildly, was arrogant right into the face of the president, and that was the end of it. Uh, very thorough search uh, on his tax evasion schemes, which he, like everybody else in Russia, used uh, was successful, and the, the fate of Khodorkovsky, you know. And from that moment on, the trust to the equal dialogue with tycoons was over. Uh, everybody else understood that this is the end. The, the, the state equalized the chances. Uh, it can use very harsh methods if you step out of your way. Uh, if you deal with the, with the, with your, with your, if you mind your own business, uh, uh, you're okay. If, if you s play politics, that's the end of it. So that's the separation stage. Uh, where we're we now? The crisis Russia is uh, living through, uh, by the way, uh, probably a little better than some of uh, uh, other Central and Eastern European states, but probably worse than, of course, developed economies and developed democracies because of the institution uh, uh, and traditions and, and, and everything else. But the crisis we're living through uh, will change the elites, both on the political side and on the business side. We will not hear some of the names. In top 100 Forbes, there were about 20 Russians. They lost about 200 billion in capitalization. There are new people coming up. And if we are to survive as G8 country, and that's not us alone who will determine this fate, if we are to build a democratic partnership society, with no such huge and unacceptable dichotomy between the top 10, top 10 percent of the wealth, and bottom 10, the, 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 the losers of our society, the poor people who are still uh, between 30 and 40 uh, percent. If we are to build a civil society and civilized society, which is no threat to the neighbors, but respected and respectful, then we will change business and government relationship, business and power relationship to um, equal, uh, respectful, and uh, productive relationship, well, like, uh, like our peers and, and, uh, uh, who, who are benchmarking for us uh, from, from the developed economies. To do this, we have to do a lot of things. Number one, we have to straighten out our own internal crisis. At the moment, the crisis, economic crisis is one thing, but its reflection in trying, trying to find a, a long-term solution for Russia is very obvious. Right inside the government, you will have two first vice prime ministers. One would firmly stay for state capitalism, if you take all those... Uh, uh, masquerading and, and, and uh, uh, sort of nice words out, he's standing and he, behind him there is a, quite a cohort of people for state capitalism, for uh, enhanced and national energy sector, war industrial sector, transport sector, and so on and so forth. And he has every reason to say so because the market failures showed that at the expense of one-seventh of the world at such a landmass, some of those infrastructural networks cannot be controlled by private business effectively. That, that, that's a simple truth, especially in the situation of depleting population. Uh, 
And at the same government, you have uh, another first vice prime minister who is a moderate liberal who says, no way, we cannot spend all this money to support state sector. We will do whatever we can to help our economy by stimulus package, by redeeming some of the uh, troubled assets, but then bringing it back to the market. Uh, I think we, had, we should... Uh, greet the president of Serbia and uh, I stop here just to say hello and thank you for, for attending my session. Uh, I think it's Dobre Došli, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, when we figure out what Russia wants to do, whether it's after the crisis wants to become a state capitalist country with a very strong uh, state sector uh, feeding in a non-transparent, as always, uh, in a not very efficient way like any state sector in any country of the world, uh, but uh, handling the situations of this huge geopolitical space this way, then this is one scenario, and then I don't think that the business will play a serious role in it. It will be SMEs, it will be something else, but not them. And there is another option for which I stand, for which I speak, for which I uh, fight sometimes. This is the moderate liberalism when recognizing that such uh, a landmass cannot deal with all its problems without strong state and without some state companies. Nevertheless, 60-70% of GDP should be produced by the private sector. It should be socially responsible. It should work in accordance with the generally accepted rules, both financial and uh, of corporate responsibility, and it should live together with the rest of the world. No protectionism, openness to the world, WTO membership, OECD membership, very hard work within G20, hard work with the IMF and other countries, uh, good maneuvering around the three superpowers on our border, which is United States, European Union, and China, and in this difficult environment, nevertheless, open, friendly, strong, and uh, forward-looking Russia. So that's my alternative. That's alternative of at least the 15% of the population, but I wouldn't say the majority. And I stop here for the questions and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Jurgens, for that uh, frank and extraordinarily clear presentation. Uh, you gave us more than we bargained for or we asked for. You gave us a whole uh, uh, short course in, in the recent history of Russia uh, and its political economy. Um, I know there are many, many questions out there, so let's, let's go straight to some of those. Could you bring the microphone down here this year? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tatiana and I come from Ukraine. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the great speech. <laughs> Shenko, I, I don't know. It's up Let's to you. leave it outside. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm really, I really appreciate what you said and I would like maybe to continue your last uh, statement about Russia and about the future of Russia. Uh, we have noticed that uh, the relationship, the political relationship with Russia and its uh, Eastern European and uh, ex-Soviet states uh, neighbors has been very emotional. <laughs> and uh, could you please tell me, I mean, I, I don't know, I'm not an insider in uh, Russian politics, but are there any movements in the Russian politics later that would try to solve these problems or try to stabilize our relationship and other economic incentives maybe which could help? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, economic incentives is the way I would, uh, I would uh, operate in this part of the world because political incentives, we tried and we failed. Uh, I think that the European Union uh, uh, at the moment uh, undertakes a very bold initiative of this Eastern partnership with the people whom they all all of them accused of, like Lukashenko being the last dictator of Europe, uh, Voronin being the last 
communist leader of Europe, etc., etc., etc. So they try to deal with a very difficult, difficult contingent with which we try to deal. We failed. Hopefully, they will they will deal with that. Uh, from Russian standpoint, of course, uh, one thing is to accuse European Union of trying to further their interest at the expense of Russia and to bring new dividing lines. Another thing uh, from the standpoint of European Union is to help out those countries with uh, uh, absolutely clear conscience and trying to integrate them into the largest and so far the most successful integration project. Uh, I don't think that life will be as easy uh, as it uh, looks to some in Brussels, uh, but it will not be as macabre as it looks to some in Moscow. Uh, there will be divisions, there will be standoffs. Uh, each time Russia was promised that NATO infrastructure will not be advanced further than Berlin, and that was uh, oral uh, sort of uh, agreement between uh, Kohl and uh, Gorbachev. Uh, each time we are, of course, uh, disappointed when, nevertheless, infrastructure advances. But is our reaction wise, or should we do it uh, in some, some other way? I do not have uh, 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 an easy and ready answer to this. Because such a big nation as Russian Federation, with such huge geopolitical interest, mineral resource control, all of this uh, transit and other problems which we have with our neighbors, of course it's easier to deal with them on a bilateral basis than through the mediation from Brussels. Each time Brussels come in, uh, there is a, a suspicion of uh, uh, behind-the-scenes scenario. Uh, it's becoming more complicated at the time when, in, in, from my point of view, it should become easier. Uh, we have a change of guard in Kremlin. We have a new president who wants to do a lot of good things with the West. But all of a sudden, in, and by coincidence or by historical uh, uh, tragedy, we have Georgian case, then we have Ukrainian transit case, and so on and so forth. Until we figure out, first of all, of course, in Russia, but then bilaterally with the European Union and the United States, how we react on all of this. There will be no peace on our borders, uh, at least in the minds of people. And that's, that's tragic. That's not very comfortable, but we have to figure it out. How do we deal with that? We have a question up there. <laughs> Sir. Hello, um, my name is Shmulek, I'm from Israel. First of all, uh, I can only speak for myself, but perhaps this will echo the sentiments of other people here. I think you gave a superb presentation, and it's, uh, for us it's, it's not a regular experience to see someone with such a high position speaking so frankly about the problems of his country, so thank you for that, first and foremost. <laughs> Um, continuing this trend, though, I must ask you probably a sincere question. I hope it's, you won't find it too sincere. Um, we have uh, a large population, of relatively large population of Russian immigrants in Israel, and this makes us relatively more aware of Russian politics sometimes. And one of the things we often find is uh, a very undemocratic climate in Russia, and this, I believe, centers mainly around... Uh, the character of the current uh, prime minister, which I think to the West is still seen as the main decision maker in the country. And this can be seen either from Guardian reports about the uh, personal fortune of $20 billion, which didn't exactly come only of wise investment. Uh, this can be seen in um, reports, even YouTube videos of uh, public television being censored uh, just uh, one video that I saw that really amazed me is uh, you see a popular show with magician and the magician writes the name Putin and suddenly the show goes all blank and moves to like dancers or something. So um, if you could please um, tell how do you think that the Russians themselves, you the prime minister and his role 
uh, in Russia today, is this not a huge block to, for Russia's way to democracy, um, equality, and so on? Well, the easiest for me would be to say Shabbat Shalom, and since we are not supposed during the Jewish Saturday to work at all, I, I, st I go away and that's it. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> But I will not say Shabbat Shalom, and I will try to answer you. Uh, well, first of all, of course, uh, the, 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 the uh, person and personality of Mr. Putin is demonized out of a proportion. He stood up against some of his good friends in the West uh, for his personal uh, bitterness for a number of reasons. After September 11, he opened his heart, and that, that's, that's truly so, to Mr. Bush, he allowed, which n nobody would ever dream of, to use our space for the NATO uh, planes, for the, uh, uh, for the uh, support of the Afghanistan troops, not NATO troops. He exchanged intelligence information and many other things. Then he retreated from Cuba. Then he retreated from Lardos, for, from, the, from the base in Vietnam. He was severely criticized. So he, he thought that he's building up good relationship with the West. But the way he saw it, he was let down. He was let down by the uh, extension of uh, NATO uh, infrastructure in the Baltic states, then further in Bulgaria, Romania. Uh, then Kosovo case was uh, the case when uh, uh, Russia was outsmarted, and that, that was also not, 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 very, not, not very good from his standpoint, and so, so many other things. Uh, now, when it came to pick up a successor, and of course we're not a classical democracy, and of course with his popularity, I mean Putin's popularity at 75%, uh, the guy wh whom he picks as, as a candidate uh, would have been chosen and would have been elected. So when he picked up his successor, he had actually two uh, serious uh, uh, frontrunners, even of Minister of Defense and Medvedev, a lawyer from St. Petersburg, from the family of lawyers, uh, known liberal, and, and so on and so forth. I mean, liberal within within very moderate bracket, but. Uh, Still, compared to even after the Minister of Defense, totally different uh, candidate. So he picked up Medvedev. I think that was his choice. He understands that his bitterness vis-a-vis -vis the West is not very constructive. He cannot change himself. He is Russian Orthodox. He is from the uh, security and uh, intelligence uh, background. He, he is tied up with many other people who are of the same uh, predisposition. He built up the structure of the, the Chechen war, which is a vertical of power when the country was collapsing and dismantling. So he could, he, I don't think that he, that he can step on, on his own throat and become a liberal again. But to overly uh, demonize him w wouldn't be a correct thing either. So at the moment, we stand the chance that uh, under the gentleman agreement, he deals with hard economic issues and he gives uh, Medvedev a chance to uh, retune, to, to reset. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, on the level of those personal freedoms, I don't think that we went very uh, uh, far backward. Uh, I think that we're free to travel, we're free to speak. I think that uh, most of the uh, written uh, media uh, printed media, uh, most of it is free, but uh, three first channels of Russian television is controlled by the state, which is not acceptable for the intelligent and uh, uh, freedom-loving people. Uh, something is being done. The steps are too cautious for the taste of some, are too bold for the, uh, for the taste of others. Uh, there, is, there are analogies between uh, Khrushchev's Tau and, and, and Medvedev's uh, uh, new era, hopefully, uh, will work for the better. We'll report to you next Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> One more. One last question here. Um, my name is Alexei. I, I'm a Russian national, but I studied the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and Harvard Kennedy School in the U.S. Igor Yuryevich, you are viewed in Russia not only as a representative of the business community, but also a 
well, I think I may say one of the leaders of the expert community. That's why I would ask you, how do you see the role of the expert community in this discussion of the future of Russian economy, state capitalism versus uh, liberal approach? Thank you. That's an excellent question. Uh, the dialogue or this uh, discourse or discussion didn't take place until very recently, and the crisis gave an opportunity to the economic cluster of expert community to start talking. And I would say that this is a very profound talk. It started with economic talk, but as any economic talk, it, it immediately had repercussions on the social sphere. And the people start talking about unemployment, about pension reform, about the depleting of our resources, what it's in for the so-called mono cities when the population depends uh, entirely on one plant and you have nothing around 1,500 or 1,500 kilometers around you, and so on and so forth. So from economic dialogue and economic discussion, social discussion started. Social discussion cannot be free without political discussion. So now people are discussing what's in the future for Russia. And from this point of view, I think that given the passivity of the Russian population in general, given the tiredness after all those reforms and people since 91 are being sh shocked by all kind of uh, reforms and they just want to leave me alone kind of a thing, you know. Uh, so given the passivity of this expert community, and this is, this is your question, should play an engine of the reform role. Otherwise, there is no other force because so-called Democrats and liberals are demoralized because of their own personal behavior and because of the lack of a leader who would uh, consolidate them. Uh, left forces are totally annihilated because of their uh, lack of leadership again and, and, and charisma and, and, and mission. And the center is very amorphous. So to, to make it short, I would say that expert community and its discussion, which at the moment looks very academic and short circuit nevertheless is number one to change the country if we can change it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Excellent.